Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God, we ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious, it's fun, it's your Catholic Drive Time. Now here's your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you on this beautiful Thursday, September the 29th, 2022. On the Saints of um, St. Michael, uh, the feast day of Saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, the Archangel. So praise be to God for that. Here's a good question. Hey, are the fascists back in style? Had the fascists come back to Italy? Is Georgia Maloney as bad as we are told? Or perhaps as she as conservative as we've been led to believe? Well, we're going to have a conversation around that with Mr. Julio Laredo from the Tradition Family and Property in Italy. Uh, coming up at 35 past the hour, so join us for that. He uh, he lives in Rome, or lives, I think he lives in Naples, but nonetheless, he is intimately familiar with the Italian politics, and he'll give us some insight into Miss Maloney coming up this hour. Also, hey, guess what? Great news. Brand new Synodal Way art is fresh off the press. Oh, yeah, and it's stylish, or some would say revealing. We're going to have a conversation around what exactly it reveals at uh, 15 past the hour. Hector Molina is going to be on with us at the top of the next hour, talk about the Sunday gospel to get you up and ready to go for Holy Mass this weekend. Praise be to Jesus. Uh, but there is lots of stories in the news. More than 2 million people are without power uh, this morning in uh, Florida as the hurricane has weakened down to, I think it's a Category 1, expected to be a tropical storm in just a few hours, but uh, there's been lots of storm surge, flooding, damage, and more. So more on that this hour. Hey, a 74-year-old Michigan man did admit to shooting an 84-year-old pro-life canvasser, but I guess what? No charges have been filed, and to this date, still no FBI raid on his house. So I guess there's that. And did you catch it? CDT is big time. Oh, yeah. We made oh, Tucker yeah. Carlson last night. <laughs> I oh, saw yeah. that. I want to thank the Academy. I want to thank God, my mom and my dad. Who else am I supposed to thank? I'd also like to uh, thank Tucker Carlson Tucker. for not for uh, covering our logo. <laughs> covering <laughs> our logo. By the way, way. Tucker, <laughs> cease and desist. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> they played a clip that uh, from our interview with Mark Houck. We interviewed Mark uh, not only a bunch of times, but a million times. Uh, but we had him on back in March because he was sharing with us some of the difficulties he was uh, facing uh, with his son at the pregnancy at the abortion clinic there in Philadelphia and how they were sort of uh, getting into their faces and, and just shouting vulgarities, vulgarities, just uh, excrement coming out of the mouth at them and uh, and how his son was trying to endure that, how difficult it was, why he took his son there at, at all. It's a great conversation. I'll put it in the email this week so that you can rewatch that uh, conversation with Mark Calc. Well, they played a clip of that on Tucker Carlson's program last night, in addition to interviewing Ryan Marie, his wife, uh, who recounted uh, the, the tragedy, the, the, the sort of the, the, the stressfulness of having all of these FBI agents swarming your property and your house and taking your husband away in handcuffs. So uh, if you missed that Tucker Carlson clip last night, I'm sure it's available on YouTube. He also saw this morning that Coolio died. Uh, 59 years really? old. Yeah, Coolio. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I got to hang out with Coolio one night at a club in Hawaii when I was in the Marine Corps. Um, so it was a, it, come on, y'all, let's take a ride. It was a wild ride that How's night. How's warm you? Wow. It was a, a wild <laughs> ride. So I don't know the circumstances of Coolio's life, but do keep him in your prayers, the repose of his soul. And all those that would go to uh, to see the Lord today, uh, let's be prepared for judgment, let's Amen. just say. Hey, uh, good morning to you, Rudy Carlos. Good morning, Joe. And uh, wow, let's keep also in our prayers, people of Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, the, the hurricane is starting to go down. So that's uh, that's pretty good, right? Yeah, praise be to God. My dad uh, did text me this yeah, morning. Yeah, your dad? Uh, he, he, so far, so good. No power, of course, Oof. and but minimal damage in his area of Orlando. So thankfully. Good. Thankfully, everything's okay there. But uh, anyway, uh, hopefully, maybe in the after show, you can rap the Coolio song. That'd be uh, fun. I'll look one up. Yeah, I'll look one maybe. up. I'll, Come I'll do my on, y'all, let's take a ride. Have you seen those, like, uh, 
Just jump <laughs> seen those inside. pictures of uh, people taking uh, yeah. pop songs and then putting them to Gregorian chant. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Latin Latin versions of them, too. It's, it's, it's always a good time. It's terrible. It's I like when time. they make medieval versions of them. Do you? Yeah. Why? With the fife? With the lute. And the, the lute. Yeah. The lute. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise be to God. Also, guess who's joining us in studio today? Our good friend Pesky Jesuit. Longtime listener, Catholic Drive Time, is hanging out with us in the studio this morning. We're going to talk to him in the after show. He's brought us some gifts, too. They're pretty cool. Yeah, I got So uh, good times there. Uh, but we have a lot to get into today. Let's jump in. Let's pray, and uh, let's get started. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now your headlines with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to Catholic Drive Time. Today is Thursday, September 2nd, and, uh, not 2nd, my apologies, the 29th of September. And here are your headlines this morning. Reuters reports China fears Giorgia Maloney may cut Italy out of Belt and Road debt trap. China's Global Times state newspaper warned Italian Prime Minister-to-be Giorgia Maloney, the right-wing leader whose party won Sunday's na national legislative elections, in an article on Tuesday not to adhere to promises to try to distance Italy from China's influence or undo deals under the banner of the Belt and Road Initiative. The BRI is a global infrastructure program in which China offers poor countries predatory loans to be used to build infrastructure projects, particularly ports, roads, and railways. While the provisions of the BRI contracts are often secret, the little public information available indicates that China imposes high interest rates on the loans and makes demands that party countries cannot meet, then uses the demands to seize control of the projects built under the BRI deal. The Hill reports senior Pentagon official says U.S. absolutely not involved in Nord Stream damage. Uh, kind of a weird thing to say, no? A senior U.S. official said the United States is not involved in the damage of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines carrying Russian gas earlier this week, saying many of our partners think, uh, I think, have determined or believed it is sabotage, the official said. I'm just not at the point where I can tell you one way or the other, the U.S. representative said. Russian officials said that the FSB Security Service is probing the incident as an act of international terrorism, authorities told Interfax. And Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peshkov told reporters Wednesday that suggestions that Russia would damage its own gas pipeline were predictably stupid. Reuters reports, ex-FBI official who led Unabomber task force decries deployment of SWAT teams for January 6 arrests. The man who led the FBI Unabomber Task Force, which ultimately arrested violent suspected terrorist Theodore Kaczynski without deploying a tactical team, is now decrying the use of SWAT teams to arrest January 6 defendants for misdemeanors and warning of the politization, politiza politicization that is, of the Bureau. FBI whistleblower Stephen Friend says the Bureau suspended him and uh, from his job recently from raising for raising a range of concerns about the FBI and DOJ's conduct in the January 6 investigation, including the Bureau's use of SWAT teams to arrest January 6 defendants facing misdemeanor charges, thus violating, he alleges, the Bureau's domestic investigations and operations guide, and creating potentially unsafe encounters. Catholic News Agency also reports, 40 Days for Life in Spain announces guidelines amid government harassment of pro-lifers. The first 40 Days for Life campaign in Spain since the government criminalized what is deemed harassment at abortion businesses by pro-lifers begins today and ends November 6th. And those are your headline news this morning. God love you. The saint of the day, well, it's Michaelmas, so we have to talk about St. Michael. St. Michael is the chief of the angels who fought against the devil and the bad angels and threw them into hell. He is the chief of the guardian angels of individuals and also of institutions. He himself is the guardian angel of the institution of all institutions, which is the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. He has therefore a mission of tutelage. Regarding such mission, we can ask what relation exists between St. Michael's first mission of defeating the revolted angels and the protection he gives men in this Valley of Tears. 
The two missions are linked. God wanted St. Michael to be his shield against the devil in the first celestial fight. He also wants St. Michael to be the shield of men against the devil and the shield of the Holy Catholic Church as well. But St. Michael does not limit himself to be a shield of protection. He is also a sword to defeat and hurl the enemy into hell. It is a double mission that is correlated. For this reason, in the Middle Ages, St. Michael was considered the first knight, the celestial knight, faithful, strong, and pure as a knight should be. He was also victorious because he put all his trust in God. And after the birth of Our Lady, all his confidence in her. It is this admirable figure of St. Michael whom we should consider our natural ally in the fights in which we are called to engage in defense of the honor of God, Our Lady, the Holy Church, and Christian civilization. With St. Michael as our model, we should defend them as a shield and attack their enemies as a sword in order to destroy the devil's empire and establish the reign of Mary on this earth. St. Michael should be our special patron. But in our days, people are enthusiastic about money, petty politics, worldly things, the trivial life, and its little news. They are no longer elevated souls who are enthused by great doctrinal problems and celestial things. What we are so greatly lacking today is precisely what the holy angels can obtain for us. They are inundated with a heavenly happiness which they can communicate to us. So let us ask them to give us the desire for celestial things. This is an excellent thing to ask on St. Michael the Archangel's feast day, that we might model ourselves after him and become the perfect knights of Our Lady on this earth. That's from the saint of the day from Professor Plinio. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from John chapter 1, verses 47 through 51. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Here is a true child of Israel. There is no duplicity in him. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we've covered this passage, I even just recently, it wasn't even all that long ago when this passage came up yet again. So we've talked about it a number of times on the show. But pop quiz, who is the first person in sacred scripture to be called the son of God? Do you know? Can you guess? It is not Jesus, by the way. It is, in fact, David. In 2 Samuel 7, 14, he was his, or actually it's referring to his son Solomon, but nonetheless, it would be the successor of David that would be called the son of God. Well, unlike the Davidic pre, uh, predecessors, the kings of Israel, Jesus is different, and it's meant differently here. Jesus, the son of God by nature and not by covenant of divine adoption, says Ignatius Catholic Commentary today. So very, very interesting. Augustine says, good preachers, however, who preach Christ are as angels of God. They ascend and descend upon the Son of Man as Paul, who ascended to the third heaven and descended so far even as to give milk to babes, close quote, St. Augustine. St. Chrysostom would say, what the greater thing is, he proceeds to show. And he saith unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. See how he raises him from earth for a while and forces him to think that Christ is not a mere man. For how could he be a mere man whom angels ministered to? It was, as it were, saying that he was the Lord of the angels, for he must be the king's own son on whom the servants of the king descend and ascend, descended at his crucifixion, ascended at his resurrection and ascension. Angels, too, before this came and ministered unto him, and angels brought the glad tidings of his birth. Our Lord made the present a proof of the future, after the powers he had already shown, Nathaniel would readily believe that much more would follow. Close quote, St. Chrysostom. I like the distinctions made in the early church fathers today on Nathaniel versus Peter. 
Peter says basically the same thing as Nathaniel, but upon his confession, the church is built and not Nathaniel. Why is that? Because Peter recognizes him as God. Nathaniel recognizes him as a successor of David. Let us make clear distinctions in our mind at who this Savior is, who our Lord and Savior actually is. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the second person of the Trinity. And we'll be right back. that so long as sexual activity is performed between consenting adults, there's nothing morally wrong with what's done. Is this a reasonable way of morally evaluating sexual behavior? I don't think so, and here's why. First, such reasoning justifies disturbing acts like that of Ormond Mivis, who butchered and ate a willing victim that responded to an advertisement placed on the internet. I don't think we want to say consensual cannibalism is okay. Second, the assertion arbitrarily picks consent as the only aspect of nature's design for sex as having any moral significance. If we must reverence nature's design for consensual sex, then why is it okay to not reverence nature's design for procreation? If it's okay to reject one, well, then it's okay to reject the other. So rather than reverencing consensual sex, this argument undermines it. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Men, it's time. Participate in the next National Men's March to Abolish Abortion and Rally for Personhood on Saturday, October 15th, 11.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. in Boston. There is a man connected to every abortion. Men are a big part of the problem, and it's time for all men to take responsibility and be a big part of the solution. All men of goodwill are invited to participate in the march, and everyone else is needed to show up for the rally beginning at 2 p.m. outside of the State House. For more information, go to themensmarch.com and spread the word. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 35 past the hour, Mr. Julio Laredo from Tradition Family and Property in Italy is going to be our guest to talk about Miss Giorgia Maloney. Her powerful speeches, one of which was taken down and censored on YouTube. I think it's since been restored, uh, but uh, a lot of people are painting her as the new Mussolini. I mean, she, after all, is the leader of the Brothers of Italy. Awkward, but okay. Uh, what is the deal there? Is she a fascist? Is she far right? Or is she more moderate than some people would suggest? Well, we're going to have that conversation with Mr. Julio Laredo. Join us if you can, and do share us with a friend. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. Now, I don't know if you caught this story. This is a few days old. I had this up yesterday, and I was thinking about jumping into it, but uh, we end up having Robert Spencer on, and uh, we were talking about Iran. And that is brand new art off the press for the synodal path. I don't know if you saw this or not, but this is very revealing, some would say. The Catholic Vote has an article out, catholicvote.org. Headline says, Synod art depicts women in priestly vestments, person in pride t-shirt. Uh, the article says, as a select group of church representatives gather in Fr Frascati, Italy this week, the Catholic Church's Synod on Synodality enters its continental phase. Designed experts from five continents will meet until October the 1st near Rome to review pages of summaries from the 2021-2022 regional Episcopal synods and produce from them one global synthesis document. I'll give you three guesses what that'll say. And the first two won't count. Hmm, gee, I wonder. I included in the, term, in the items for review are pieces of artwork which are highlighted on the syn synod's official social media platforms, including Facebook and Twitter. One image published on the official Synod Facebook page, includes a depiction of a woman dressed in priestly vestments. Next to her is a person wearing a rainbow pride t-shirt. Now, if you're watching us on one of the live video feeds, you can see this image. It's, uh, it's, not even, I mean, it's not even all that attractive of an image, irregardless of the political agenda being il illustrated here. It's, it's kind just a bad art style. It is just a bad art style. But nonetheless, it shows a what would look like a cathedral building behind them uh, with some banners floating about. It says, animate, blossoming, mission that is larger than any one of us. We desire to be, uh, desire to be on what? 
on advisory council or something like that. Uh, and that, you know, so there's we some, are the future. We are the future. Mm -hmm. And then there's people holding hands, uh, people of various uh, skin tones, let's just say, uh, genders. I see, well, most, yeah, I'm there's not sure what the guy a couple of was. genders going on here. And then there's this one person wearing vestments who is clearly uh, a female, depicted as a female. Now, that's very interesting. You would expect something like that, say, out of the Episcopal Church. I mean, this is pretty common there. Uh, but in the Catholic Church, of course, women can't be, be uh, ordained. And so to see the Catholic Church staff people, whomever, uh, put this together, hmm, why is that? That's very revealing. The article goes on to say the origins and purpose of the artwork are unknown. J.D. Fenn, Flynn, rather, of the Pillar reported, quote, I'm not actually sure whether it's fan art or included in a national synthesis document or has instead been sketched out while these folks are at work on the next stage, close quote. So somebody apparently was like uh, working on this, like while well, they were going through the documents. I'm not even sure. The art in question is a graphic novel style and includes English words, images and symbols, as well as the official watermark seal of the Synod, and there you go. It includes the official watermark seal of the Synod. And then there's, uh, they actually, in this uh, catholicvote.org uh, article, they actually post the Twitter screenshots from the official Synod Twitter handle. It says in Frascati 22, our experts are working on the synthesis produced during the local consultation phase, pages and pages full of stories, insights, but also, in some cases, real works of art. Uh, and then they show this particular art, which is, I would argue, not real art. It is a, it's a, it's really just confusing. It's propaganda. I mean, it's propaganda that much we know. But it's ugly. But it's ugly and confusing propaganda. Yeah. It's not like the Uncle Sam with his finger right. pointing out to say, you know, Uncle Sam needs you. Well, <laughs> what is it, Rosie Rivet? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, that was yeah. good propaganda. Yeah. Even the communists come up with better propaganda. Like, this is confusing, weird, it's not really great. It's ugly. It's, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing redeeming about this in addition to it being propaganda. Yeah, because like your eyes get lost on it. It's like you just—I don't know what to make of this. Too busy. Gospel teachings and values, love, it, embodying unconditional love. You forgot active listening. Oh, I forgot active listening. Yeah. But if you look at it from a progressive standpoint, this is like a this is probably tip top, you know, because it's mm -hmm. just it's just like buzzwords. You go to uh, or you go to any of the images of uh, protests and things. Mm -hmm. It's just buzzwords mm -hmm. on boards and stuff like ah. I hate this. I hate looking at it. You know, and I guess this emphasizes the issues we have with a synodal process. They're so anxious to reinvent the wheel here. They're so anxious to to uh, to change uh, church teaching to uh, get us to acquiesce to the world, the flesh, and the devil. James, in his epistle, reminds us to not be friends with this world, to uh, to reject the world and all of its lies in hopes of saving some in the world. It's an act of charity to reject the lies of the world. So anyway, there's been a lot, a lot of uh, backlash uh, on this, of course, and there ought to have been, because this is really, really uh, bad. In fact, I'm surprised we've not seen, and if you guys correct me, I don't think we've seen a single official statement out of the Vatican to say, hey, this is inappropriate. Of course, <laughs> no. we don't uh, ordain women. We wouldn't well, depict them as such. One thing I did see was someone had mentioned that this artwork was actually out of a— uh, a college synod in Philly, mm -hmm. and that the Vatican just started just reposted it. Which I mean, even if that's true, the official Vatican Twitter handle, the official Vatican, exactly. So the like, so the 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 official Vatican synod mm -hmm. Twitter handle retweeted it and posted it on Instagram. So even if it wasn't created by the synod itself, the official uh, <laughs> departments of the synod, these kind of departments don't interact in the same way that actual people interact. They are very yeah. uh, disciplined about what they're going to retweet, what they're going to post. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they posted is very concerning, especially the one with the uh, the yellow-orange one. 
that uh, I think it's like the second picture they posted. The yellow orange one? Yes. The, <laughs> the, the, and that one, it I'm, has the back and forth of what they're going from to what they're going to. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they're saying like, oh, you're going from from abuse to deep care, from scripture oh, to why. Okay. I got it and on one the of them right is yeah. Catholic identity to LGBTQ identity. Right, yeah. And you're like, what? Mm-hmm. And then from intolerance to, uh, to a tolerance and... This is an issue. This is actually an issue because having tolerance, we tolerate evil things. And that's what that's the definition of tolerance. Because if you are agreeing with something or you love something, you're not tolerating it. You're enjoying it. It's something that's good. You're supporting it. But if you are intolerant, you are intolerant of things that are bad. And so we really should have a spirit of intolerance. And it talks about exclusion to inclusion. That's another problem, because if we include everything, you cease to being anything. Just like if a country completely opens its borders and allows every single person to come in, you're no longer a country because you're just you're just you have open everything. So an organization has to exclude somebody. Yeah. And the people that are excluded from the church are people who don't believe in the faith. Yes, uh, it is very, very concerning, which reminds us of all of the continued insanity coming out of some of the bishops in Europe. And I saw this other story this morning. Dutch Cardinal condemns Belgian bishops, same-sex blessings, calls for Vatican correction. Praise be to God. Uh, I I would agree, and I think this ought to be addressed uh, as soon as possible. In Utrecht, Netherlands, the Cardinal Archbishop of Utrecht, Wilhelm uh, Echt, Echt, I don't know how to say his name correctly, Mia Culpa, has called for the Flemish bishops of Belgium to be corrected by ecclesiastical authorities for their departure from the church's moral and sacramental discipline with their publication of the, quote, right of blessing, close quote, for the same-sex couples. The Flemish bishops document with its proposed liturgical blessing for same-sex couples was issued on September the 20th, shortly after German bishops approved documents of their synodal way, insisting on acceptance of homosexual unions by the church. Cardinal Echt of Utrecht strongly objected to the so-called right of blessing, pointing out several reasons it must be rejected and the bishops responsible publicly corrected. Although the blessing does not claim the status of equality of the sacrament of marriage, the cardinal drew attention to the fact that it nonetheless clearly models itself on the right of marriage. Well, even if they did claim that, it wouldn't be true. Okay, you can you can claim all you wish. Uh, That doesn't make it true just because one claims it. The article goes on to say the Declaration Prayer Act said in which same-sex couples commit to each other shows an unequivocal analogy with the I do that a man and a woman say to each other during the marriage ceremony. However, as it is, uh, as is obvious to Catholics who adhere to church's teaching on the sinfulness of homosexual acts and the inherent disorder of homosexual inclinations, such a uh, commitment to each other on the part of same-sex couples would constitute grave public sin and stand contrary to the natural order of human sexuality established by God, an order founded upon the sexual complementarity of man and woman for the sake of procreation. Therefore, as is as the cardinal insists, such a commitment by same-sex couples cannot be blessed by God or the church. Yea and amen, Cardinal. Thank you for your uh, for your outspokenness on this issue. Calling out brother bishops, I understand, is very uncomfortable and not fun, but needed nonetheless. And uh, we do need clarity. In a world of confusion, clarity is charity. And uh, we need to see more of this from these bishops who don't want to stand, because ultimately they are pushing very hard. I mean, just look at this artwork. I make. I think it makes it very clear. Uh, official Vatican Twitter feeds, et cetera. There is an, an implicit approval. There is an implicit, implicit uh, uh, endorsement of these grave, immoral behaviors, pretending as though these things are good, okay, and they're not. They're harmful. They're harmful to the people who practice them. They're harmful to the people who think that they're okay. And they are incredibly harmful to the next generation of young people who are going to be confused by such mixed messaging. Uh, the, our Lord and Savior is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his, he is God, as the gospel makes clear to us today. He is God incarnate. And so if, if that's true, then that has incredible implications on how we choose to live our life. Do you see what I'm saying? If he's not just a prophet, not just a good man, a good teacher, he's not just some nice guy saying eloquent things, but if he, in fact, is God taken upon flesh, 
then what he has taught, what he has asked his church to do has grave implications upon humanity. And we should pay very close attention to that. So it is either true or it is not. And if it is true, then you must change your life. You must choose very carefully, very wisely, how you're going to live your life. It is not about just saying no to people. It is about saying yes to God and the design he has for our life. And if we embrace such error, such immorality, it will lead to the destruction of souls. And one day we will all stand before the Creator, and we will have to give an account for every word, every deed we've ever committed. We should prepare well while we still have time. Hey, listen, coming up after this break, Rudy Carlos is going to catch us up on the news again, and then Mr. Julio Laredo is going to be on. Are fascists back in power in Italy? We'll have that conversation next. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard someone say, the Catholic view of marriage may be an ideal, but it cannot be a reality? Well, G.K. Chesterton says, it is an ideal in a diseased society, it is a reality in a healthy society. For where it is real, it makes society healthy. We know we cannot make a perfectly healthy society because while we believe in marriage and the church, we also believe in something called the fall of man, which also has an effect on society. Society. But the point is that we believe not just in an ideal, but in something practical. Practical in the sense that we want to make something. We want to create Christian families as opposed to those who are always ready to destroy the family, who give up on the ideal and give in to whatever is easiest at the moment. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org. Hi, this is Pam Stenzel. Come participate in the next National Men's March to Abolish Abortion and Rally for Personhood on Saturday, October 15th in Boston. Men gather outside of the Planned Parenthood on Commonwealth at 11.30 a.m. for the march, and then everyone else show up at the 2 p.m. rally outside of the State House, where I'll be speaking about the need to value and protect every pre-born baby from fertilization. For more information, go to themensmarch.com and spread the word. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. And now, more headlines. Sky News reports, Joe, you're going to love this one. Drinking two to three cups of coffee a day linked to a longer life. Drinking two to three cups of coffee a day could be linked to a longer life. Research suggests that when compared to avoiding coffee, it also associated, it was also associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. The study's findings applied to ground, instant, and decaffeinated versions of the drink, and researchers suggested coffee consumption could be considered part of a healthy lifestyle. This was, uh, the study was published in the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology. Catholic News Agency reports four regions of Ukraine to be folded into Russia on Friday. The Kremlin says that uh, four regions of Ukraine that held referendums on joining Russia will, Russia will be incorporated into the country on Friday. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peshkov said that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, will attend a ceremony in the Kremlin at which they will officially be folded into Russia. And I'm sorry, that was actually from Ground News. Daily Wire reports Hurricane Ian slams into Florida as powerful Category 4 hurricane. Hurricane Ian slammed into southwest Florida as a powerful category for hurricane on Wednesday afternoon, after more than 2 million Floridians were given evacuation orders. With 150 mile per hour winds, Hurricane Ian is tied for the fourth strongest hurricane to ever hit the state, according to meteorologist Philip Klotzbach. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said that his administration mobilized fleets of high water vehicles, 42,000 linemen, and 7,000 National Guardsmen and 179 aircraft to respond to the hurricane. Prior to hitting Florida, Hurricane Ian knocked out Cuba's entire electrical grid and uh, it plunged the entire communist island into darkness. Those were your headline news this morning. God love you. Praise be to God in all things. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up today. By the way, if you're not on our email list, you should get on our email list. I, I will include the, the uh, video that uh, Tucker Carlson used in his uh, cast last night from our show in the email list. I'll send that out tomorrow around noon. I also always include some great entertainment for your weekend as well. You can join our email list on our website at grnonline.com forward slash c. D.T. Joining us right now from Italy, from the Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Properties, Mr. Julio Laredo. Good morning to you, Mr. Laredo. 
Good morning to you, Joe. Good morning to everybody, and thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, praise be to God. It's good to see you again. Uh, last time we had you in studio live, so we're uh, grateful to have you back on the program. Uh, so much has happened since then to catch up on, but let's talk about Italy. There's been a lot of talk here in, uh, in North America about fascism on the rise again in Italy with the, uh, the rise of the Brothers of Italy Party and the first ever Prime Minister of Italy being a female, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Giorgia Maloney. Tell us about this from your perspective, having lived there for so long. Well, to, to, to begin with, all this rubbish, all this uh, fascist accusation is just rubbish. You have to understand <clears throat> one thing, that for many decades, what was conservatism in Italy, I mean in 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, was uh, associated in one or other way with the, with the fascist party of Benito Mussolini. Mm. The real fascists were a minority within the fascist party. But because it was the only anti-communist party, it attracted people who were not fascist. They were Catholic, they were anti-communist, they were conservatives, they were against the decadence of the family, and so on. <clears throat> so from that fact comes that a part of the conservative public in Italy, in one way or, or the other, has one or two roots in that reality. So. It's true to say that Georgia Meloni, in her coalition, has a minority, but I'd say it's extreme minority, that comes from that, let's call it, tradition. But that's absolutely false. First, that she's a fascist, and second, that she's bringing fascism to power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I heard this morning, I think it was on, um, hmm, maybe it was Deutsche Welle or maybe it was the BBC, I can't recall, but they, they even went so far as to say that she herself uh, was an admitted fascist in her youth, in her younger years, uh, I guess coming out of, uh, you know, in her 20s or whatnot. So I don't know if you know much of her background there, but uh, did she ever mm -hmm. actually, was she a, an out and out uh, proponent of fascism ever in her life? Now, she was a militant when she was young. She was a militant of the MSI, the, uh, so the Italian social movement, which was the ideal heir to the fascist party. Mm -hmm. But it was a democratic party. It had a, a, uh, um, it had a very important representation in parliament. And it had done away with all the errors of fascism. As I said, what the MSI did, it assumed the inheritance, it assumed the tradition of anti-communism in Italy. Now, that there were string minorities that continued to be fascist, that's a, that's a, that's a fact, but that's not her case. Yeah, she, her, her speeches are getting quite a bit of attention, uh, very powerful, very passionate speeches that she's made, not only in the Italian parliament, but at various events that have made the videos online. In fact, YouTube took one down recently. I think they did re reinstate it after the backlash. Uh, but some are comparing her to Viktor Orban in Hungary or um, Marie Le Pen in France. How do you see her? Well, the thing is this, and this is an extremely important point for an analyst like me. In politics, it's less important what the person or who the person is, the candidate or the president is, rather than what he represents. Georgia Meloni re 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 represents the anti-revolutionary reaction in Italy. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important fact. Just as in the United States, excuse me, if I give an American uh, example, you can think about Trump, whatever you want. He represents a certain reaction. He represents a certain movement <clears throat> of the public that doesn't want to go in the wrong way, meaning the leftist way. So Georgia Meloni right now, she, because after the flop of Silvio, uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, after the flop of Matteo Salvini, she is representing this reaction. She is representing this movement which has been very visible. I've, I've written up about this reactive move, movement already in the late 1990s. It was already visible back then. So what we have to, to do, and the, the most intelligent and most uh, open uh, analysts and politicians in Europe and in the world, that's what they're doing, say, let's uh, stop with all this uh, name, name calling and see exactly what she's going to do.
because she's not even president. I mean, she she she, uh, she she hasn't been elected, and this is another another point. In Italy, there's a parliamentarian system. What happened is that her coalition got a majority in parliament. Now the president of the state, Sergio Mattarella, will have to convoke her to form a government. Then she will have to submit that government to parliament, and if she manages to have a majority, then she will be named uh, prime minister. Oh, wow. I didn't realize how many more steps there were in that process. But the uh, one thing that really caught my eye whenever she was, the, her speech, she had mentioned God, homeland, and family. And immediately I was thinking, uh, I don't know the context. I'm not very uh, well read in fascist material. So people were immediately like, uh, she, the, her speech is very fascist. I'm like, is, was that a calling cry of the fascist? I don't know. But what it did sound like to me was I was thinking, I was like, that sounds like a, the calling cry of tradition, family and property. Uh, what did you think about that speech that kind of went viral? Look, um, uh, Dio, Patria, Familia, God, Fatherland, and Family is one of the traditional mottos of, of, of the conservatives, of the traditionalists, and not only in Europe, but uh, in Italy, but throughout, throughout Europe. Now, that is very similar to tradition, family, and property, and indeed, the organ of the extreme left called Il Reformista, the uh, uh, reformist, said that Meloni represents tradition, family, and property. Now, I know her personally in the sense that I've spoken with her very quickly a, a couple of times. There are no institutional contacts between us and her party and, and her personally, but there are many friends within her party because, as I said, she has served as a rallying point for so many people who want to react. And that's the important fact. Mm. There are even one think tank already opened, and another one in the making, so as to give a more traditionalist Catholic uh, content to her party. So if, to the extent that uh, the party um, uh, strategists, let's call it, the, um, uh, will give, um, will give uh, space for the ideas coming from these uh, think tanks and from Catholic traditionalism or from Catholicism, in general, I think that she will do a good government. In to the extent that she will open windows to the other side, mm -hmm. it will be bad. Already, two or three ministers that have been spoken about are not good. Wow. Uh, we have just about a minute before we have to go to a hard break. We're talking to Mr. Julio Laredo from the Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property. Uh, you know, people are loving. There's so much I want to cover. I'll do more on the other side of the break. But they are loving her pro-family, pro-God, anti uh, anti-globalist platform, and yet it was the lowest turnout in uh, in recent Italian elections. Anything to that? You got about uh, 30, 40 seconds. Well, um, you have to, to listen to her speech during the World Congress of Families, I think 2018, in Verona. I was there. It was there where I knew her personally. We spoke about 15 minutes. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna have to pause you. Though we just. I didn't time that well enough. But Mr. Julio Laredo uh, is our guest. We're gonna pick up right there on the other side of the break. Plus, I want to ask about some of the party platform policies. How Catholic is she? We're gonna have that conversation. It's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Hi, this is Father Stephen Imbarato. Join us in Boston for the next National Men's March to Abolish Abortion and Rally for Personhood on Saturday, October 15th. Men, we will gather outside the Planned Parenthood to begin the march, and then we're going to meet everyone else for a 2 p.m. rally outside of the State House, where I'll be speaking about constitutional personhood for the pre-born and where we need to go from here. For more information, go to themensmarch.com. Again, details, mensmarch.com. Join us and spread the word. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Your only daughter met a fine young man who was a committed Mormon. She now wants to join his church. What's your answer? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a reason for no. Doctrinal positions such as the deity of Jesus and the Trinity. Your reason for yes. You deem seemingly moral character as superseding biblical truth. Secondly, orthodoxy. Your answer is probably no. But how and why? Your resistance to Mormon doctrine does not just come straight down from the Bible. 
Bible. It comes from the first five centuries of brilliant theologians, bishops, and popes. These Catholics wrote, debated, and fought for truth. Example, in 250 AD, 311, and 417, three different popes excommunicated three different heretics, Sibelius, Arius, and Pelagius. They denied the Trinity, the eternal deity of Jesus, or taught that human effort warranted salvation. Would your pastor excommunicate a heretic? Well, unfortunately, your pastor can only remove someone from his local congregation. But that's okay. That guy will probably end up being welcomed to a church down the street. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So going to be on with you. Praise be to God. We're having a conversation about Georgia Maloney. Um, potentially, I guess is the better way to say this, potentially the first female prime minister of Italy. Uh, there's still a few steps that have to take place. Mr. Julio Laredo is our guest. He's been talking about that. Just before the break, I was setting this up that uh, so many uh, people in the West are like, wow, look at the passion. Look at the look in her eyes when she stares down uh, those who oppose her and, uh, and, and lifts up the family, lifts up God, lifts up conservatism and national identity against a globalist agenda. And that is where you, we had to interrupt you, Mr. Julio Laredo. So if you could pick up right there. Um, I was saying, I was saying, saying, saying this. There is a process of decadence in Italy, in Europe, in the whole world, in the United States. We all see it. That dec decadence is not only political, not only economic, but but is especially culture, cultural, and therefore moral. And the reaction that has been building up in Italy, in Europe, and in so many other countries in the world expresses itself in the defense of certain values that are being denied or are being destroyed by the left. For example, national identity. Um, here in Europe, there's a tendency to form the, um, the union of the Soviet European republics. And that's not my, my line. This is uh, Vladimir Bukovsky, you know, this famous Russian dissident in, in the early 2000s. He already said, you are, we are going towards the constitution of the Union of the Soviet European Re Republics. Well, there's a whole mo movement that said, no, we are Italian. And within Italy, there's the north, there's the south, there are the several, several re regions. Therefore, a, a very healthy traditionalism. And in this sense, Georgia, Meloni, and me too, he, she is against this European Union not against a European Union. She favors what is called the Europe of Nations, that is, a free confederation of nations, each one having its own identity, its own tradition. Second point, the European uh, Union has been extremely lacist, lacist meaning lay, um, uh, attacking religious beliefs, be it Catholic or being any other, but especially Catholic beliefs. Now, that's part or Christian beliefs in general. Well, that's part of our being European. That's part of our being Western. So she's very much uh, in favor of defending the Christian traditions of Europe. The revolution wants to destroy the family as a, an, as a natural institution and as a sacrament. Mm -hmm. Well, the family is the foundation of society. It is the foundation for the uh, uh, good... Um, uh, well-being, or the well-being of the of the children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Georgia Meloni defends the family because the family, she says, it was it it's what gives us an identity. Mm -hmm. Now, so she's against a homosexual quotation marriage, mm -hmm. uh, against the LGBTQ, etc., etc. agenda, because this is all part of the cultural moral revolution that is devastating our society. Yeah. When it comes to abortion, and this is very important for American public, when it comes to abortion, her position is less clear. Because unfortunately, here in Italy, we, we, we have the 194 law approved with the support of the bishops and of the church, with the support of the bishops' conference. It was voted by a Catholic government and signed by a Catholic president, a Catholic prime minister, and four Catholic ministers. That's horrible. The only abortion law in the world that was voted by the Catholics and not by the left. Now, it's a restrictive law. 
uh, it doesn't permit, uh, well, in paper. In reality, it opened the, uh, the door wide, op wide open for uh, abortion all the way down to the ninth month of pregnancy. Now, so there are so many people who are now not well informed or not well oriented who say, let's just apply correctly that 194 law. Well, this is not good. And unfortunately, this seems to be her uh, position. So in pro-life, the strictly pro-life issues, she's a little bit less, uh, less, uh, less firm. Now, I suggest, as you said, that you hear, that you listen to her speech at the World Congress of Families in Verona, I think it's 2018. I, uh, I said I was there. And her speech uh, that was in 2019 or 20 in Spain, in Madrid, in a Vox uh, public, uh, public rally. Mr. Hmm. Loretta, I, um, I ask for your, uh, your mercy here. I, I am not as uh, informed in uh, Italian politics or what a parliamentary system there uh, looks like. But, you know, I'm wondering, since you mentioned, you know, on the difference between practical and something on paper, I'm wondering, would her victory be, would her victory bring in some sort of practical implications that we would consider uh, a win for, for conservative people? Or is it just going to be more of the same? Uh, you know, I, I, I am cautious sometimes when I see headlines of people winning elections and they champion them to be as uh, the most conservative people or a win for conservatism. But in reality, the practical implications are sometimes pretty slim, if any. What do you think? Well, I just wrote an article. I sent it to the American TFP yesterday. They, they might uh, translate it. I can send it to you in, in the original uh, Italian. You can do a Google, a, a, a Google translation. Basically, it's this. As I've been saying, there is a reaction. There's a movement of reaction that has very, very deep roots, and it's coming all the way since the 1990s. Mm. And it's very easy to follow. Well, it just happened that today, Georgia Meloni concentrated in, in her this reaction and won the first free elections in Italy since 2008. So this wow. is another point that has to be taken into consideration. Italians has, haven't voted since 2008. So parla Parliament has perpetuated itself electing people of their own mm. as president without ever uh, and ever consulting the Italian people. The first real free elections that we, we've had in 15 years are these ones now. And wow. The, and the certain, certain, yeah, those are the problems of the parliamentarian uh, system, which is very different from the presidential system that you have in the uh, United States. Now, will not so much she, but you know a party is made of scholars, it's made of analysts, it's made of um, people who actually for us write and form the, the program of the party. Will they understand that the Italian people has put in their hands not only the Italian government, but more deeply, the mission to react against the revolution? The mission, the mission to defend the family, defend the uh, national identity, defend the church, defend innocent life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and 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 that's historical mission. Will the party pundits, let's call them like this, the party pundits understand this and make an, an anti-revolutionary government, or will they uh, fall back on politics as usual? Unfortunately, the first signs have been a little bit mixed. On the one hand, there are very good signs, there are very good promises that have to be then uh, effectuated. And there's much, unfortunately, there's much politics as usual because all the parties are, are you say, vying, you know, are, are trying to, to grab their own, their own bit of the cake. How will this be? I don't know. But the fact is that there are people, the TFP, the Italian TFP is one, but there are many other people who will put uh, Georgia Meloni's gov gov government on the hot spot mm. when it comes to defending the real, the real values. Yeah. And one thing I said in this, I say in, in this article, 
um, analysts here distinguish between what they called a structural vote and a personal vote. Structural vote means a vote for the program. Personal vote means a vote for the leader. Unfortunately, Georgia Meloni has only 19 percent of structural vote, that is, a vote for her party's program. 81 percent is a personal vote for her. Now, the charisma of, of a leader comes and goes very easily. Will she be able to transform this personal vote, her own charisma, into a vote for the party's program, for the ideas, for the values? That's the great question that everybody now in, in Italy is asking himself. Real quickly, we only have a couple minutes left in our conversation. You know, you're, we're saying all these things, and American politics is receiving all this kind of propaganda. And what is the perception of the Italian people, the average Italian uh, citizen, about this whole situation? It's exactly what I said. They were, excuse me, the expression, they were fed up with not being able to vote. And they were sick and tired of seeing all these left-wing politicians become presidents without ever winning one single election. Mm -hmm. The first opportunity that they, they've, they've had to ex express their views, to express their, their mind, they voted massively. Because in the Senate, the center-right coalition, uh, the majority is 201. There are 400 senators. 201 makes a majority. They have 238 wow. Senate. Wow. In the House of Deputies, the majority um, is uh, 400. Uh, excuse me. Um, Senate is 100. Uh, Senate is 400. They, they, they have 45 votes more than the absolute majority. So they have the numbers to do a very stable government. In fact, mm. they can do whatever they want. Now, the Italian people also express itself in the regional and local elections, because along with the general national federal elections, there were many local elections. Most, except one of the left-wing candidates at the local level, mm -hmm. lost. Really? Wow. So this is also very important, and it forms the whole, the, uh, the whole picture. Mm -hmm. So the Italian people voted massively. It's not a majority of 50 plus one. It's a huge majority that they now have in parliament and at the local level. Wow. Well, we are just down to uh, the end of our conversation with Mr. Julio Laredo, Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property, based out of Italy. We're very grateful for your insight. We'll be watching keenly what happens with Ms. Maloney, and uh, hopefully that uh, she changes her heart and her policy positions and her party's position on abortion to align with true Catholic moral teaching. God bless you, Mr. Laredo. Thank you for your time today. God bless you, I and mean, again, thank you very much for inviting me. All right, praise be to God. That's going to do it for hour number one. If you can join us in the second hour, Hector Molina is going to be on to talk about the Sunday Gospel. Otherwise, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Hi, this is Sister Didi Byrne. Come participate in the next National Men's March to Abolish Abortion and Rally for Personhood on Saturday, October 15th in Boston. Men, gather outside of the Planned Parenthood on Commonwealth at 11.30 a.m. for the march. Everyone else, show up at the 2 p.m. rally outside of the State House, where I'll be speaking about the urgent need to be actively pro-life and pro-eternal life. For more information, go to themensmarch.com and please spread the word. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Can you really say you know what praying the rosary is all about? So here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, listen to the who's who of the rosary. We have the Blessed Trinity. We have the Angel Gabriel. We have the Virgin Mary. We have John the Baptist. And we have Elizabeth. So how's that for a cast of sacred ones? Secondly, reflection. While saying the rosary, we reflect on 20 primary and sacred moments that occur in the lives of the Holy Family. 
And thirdly, the rosary dynamics. Here's how you involve this cast of holy ones in praying the rosary. You first invoke the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Then, on to praying the Apostles' Creed. Then you will pray in Our Father. Then you will recite the angel Gabriel's words to Mary. Then you'll recite what Mary said to Elizabeth. And then you will relive John the Baptist being filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Then you will ask for Mary's assistance in your life. And I'm so glad to say none of that is idolatry. Hi, this is Terry Beatley. Come participate in the next National Men's March to Abolish Abortion and Rally for Personhood on Saturday, October 15th in Boston. Men, gather outside of the Planned Parenthood on Commonwealth at 1130 for the march. And everyone else, show up at the 2 p.m. rally outside of the State House, where I'll be speaking about how America's abortion king pushed the lie of abortion on the American people. For more information, go to themensmarch.com. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here. And every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today. Welcome back to Captain Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. It's hard to know just who to believe these days. Fascists on the rise. Can you hear the sound of the boots marching there? Some people would say, some would say, some would say. Do we get a pair of uh, quality Italian handmade boots? Is she Mussolini Jr.? Hmm, some people are actually painting her into that light. But you know what gets me? I meant to bring this up. We just didn't, ran out of time. Mr. Julio Laredo had so much to offer as far as context goes. You know, and she's not a perfect character by any stretch of the uh, imagination, Miss Giorgia Maloney in Italy. Uh, but she is exciting a lot of people for sure. Um, you know, what gets me is people talk about fascism as though it's some sort of conservative you know, he did talk about how they got mixed, right? So there was a lot of yeah. conservatism that got mixed into it. In uh, in the nineteenth or the uh, yeah the nineteenth century, there, eighteenth uh, the twentieth century, we're talking nineteen hundreds in Europe, socialism was on the rise all across Europe, and it became a battle, a war for for who gets to have their flavor of socialism enacted. Mm -hmm. So you have Nazi socialists, you got fascist socialists, you got communism. All still Marxist socialism, it's just different points along the journey. And they're all fighting each other over who gets to decide what their their flavor of socialism gets to be enacted. To this day, there's still some socialist uh, elements. elements still yeah. in these governments all across Europe. I mean, hello, uh, you can pretty much go to college for free as citizens of these countries because of socialism, right? So uh, it's very interesting to me how they, they paint socialism which fascism is a brand of sort of a quasi mix between socialism and free market capitalism. Uh, but the cooperation between government and, and public uh, and private entities is a socialist idea. So uh, nonetheless, they always paint this to be some sort of very Republican type of conservative thing. And it's like, no, just call for what it is, what it is like, stop, stop playing these games. I mean, it's either conservative or it is not. And in this case, they are, they're always messing with that. But uh, can we turn up the volume a little bit on that, Adrian? This is uh, Mrs. Uh, Merloni giving a speech. I think this was from 2018. And what I, one of the things I like about her, I, look at the eyes. She looks very sincere. Whether, regardless of what you think of her politics, she does look very sincere, very determined in her in her uh, in her approach and I like that about the speeches that she gives but I, I'm very concerned about where she lands on as Mr. Julia Laredo pointed out and I've seen on a website here you know she basically supports abortion uh, except for past the first three months so that's that's definitely a major problem that's a huge roadblock as Catholics um, but the point he made Mr. Laredo in the last hour if you missed it I let me encourage you to get onto our podcast feed and to uh, and to get tuned into our podcast from our conversation, Mr. Julio Laredo, is that the complexity of the abortion issue in Italy stems from the fact that you got Catholics everywhere debating this issue. 
You got Catholic bishops seemingly endorsing it. You got Catholic parliamentarians seeming, uh, you know, also endorsing it, voting for it. Catholic, 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 Catholic. So unless you're like super solid in your faith and you can stand against the Catholic tide of Catholicism uh, being hijacked by certain individuals, well, I hope she can. I hope she, if in fact she becomes the prime minister, I hope in fact she changes this for Italy, changes the course of, of the direction of this. But if you haven't seen any of her, of her talks, of her speeches, of her presentation, especially the one in Parliament, there's like one of her going off in Parliament. Could you imagine if our system was like that? Like, you see these senators no, basically throwing down every time. It's all, it's theater. I mean, it, it's, it's we have theater. elements of that here, I suppose. They get up and they, st and Canada's got it. Of course, the UK has it, you know. And I just can't take it seriously. You know, they stand up and they face each other off and they start, I mean, it's like hot debate. Whereas in our system, they get to debate, but it's like timed, it's sanitized. And most of the time, your opponent is not even in the room. They're not even there listening to you. That's not cool. Yeah. Whereas this, I mean, this isn't, the video we're playing right now is not from Parliament. It's just a speech she gave. And she is like uh, very passionately. You know, one thing I notice is that she has legitimate um, actions and demeanor and tone mm -hmm. of a rhetorician. Mm -hmm. Whereas American politicians really don't have the skill of rhetoric. They kind of just give their speeches as if they're reading it. Um, even the best ones, like people would say that Barack Obama was a great rhetorician, but <laughs> yeah. really he really wasn't. Yeah. He. What about he the cadence of President things. Trump? No, Trump is not a great rhetorician either. I mean, K Trump is uh, is entertaining, but I wouldn't say that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, very interesting nonetheless. Uh, I do encourage you to check out our podcast for our conversation with Mr. Julio Laredo from the Society of uh, tradition, uh, the, the defense of the tradition, family, and property, giving us some great context on the Italian political system, on the implications of this, and so much more. You can find everything linked up on our website at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. We'll be watching it very closely, following up with that conversation when more develops there. But joining us right now by phone is our good friend Hector Molina. Good morning to you, Hector. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. How many times have you been to Italy? Have I been to Italy? Actually, only once. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Rome? I was there for the, the beatification of John Paul II. Oh, wow. Fantastic. No kidding. That, that yeah. must have been crowded. Did you get a chance to uh, to see much while you were there? I was in the front row of my hotel lobby. <laughs> 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 you couldn't move in Rome. Oh, yeah, I bet. I bet it was super crowded. Uh, yeah. All of Poland was there. Yeah. I'm sure all of Poland moving into Rome for the day. Yeah, I bet it was. Hey, let's get ready for the Sunday Gospel. Uh, I guess it's Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10 for this uh, coming Sunday. Oh, what are we looking at here? Well, Jesus continues to impart to his disciples and to the multitudes and the scribes and the Pharisees a series of what we call the hard teachings of Jesus. It's been rough over the last several chapters. He's delivered very stinging and sobering parables. And as we left off last week with the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, Jesus just prior to, to this Sunday's pericope, he delivers a series of statements regarding the importance of forgiving, of not holding on to bitterness or strife, but forgiving our neighbor. So he's really exhorting his disciples in a very, very powerful way. He's, he's calling them to holiness. Mm. And they respond to this by crying out to the Lord, saying, <laughs> Lord, increase our faith, because we just don't have it. <laughs> what you're calling us to is it's impossible by human standards to be able to fulfill. And the Lord's response is, is <laughs> again, in his inimitable way, it is quite parabolic, and it is really striking. He employs this image that many of us are familiar with, the mustard seed. He says, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this sycamine tree, be rooted up and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So he, he pulls out this image, this metaphor, 
that is really, really striking for a number of reasons. Now, this is lost on us moderns. We don't understand fully the context, and this is why Scripture study is so fascinating, because we're familiar with the mustard seed. Mm -hmm. We know that earlier in the gospel, he gives the parable of the mustard seed. He likens it to the kingdom, and the kingdom that begins as a tiny mustard seed, proverbially one of the smallest seeds known in that region. And he likens that to the kingdom that grows into this great tree, and all of us essentially abide in the branches. Well, he uses that image, but he applies it in a different way here. He says, if you have faith at the size of a mustard seed, you could say to the sycamine tree, basically be uprooted and planted in the sea. And this really would have left his listeners scratching their heads like, wait a minute, because they knew that the sycamine tree was a tree that grew to about 30, 35 feet high or tall, but its root system was one of the most extensive root systems of all the trees in the Middle East, in Palestine at that time. It would have been impossible to uproot a sycamine tree because their roots grew hundreds of feet below ground. Wow. And they were able to survive in very arid and difficult conditions uh, because their roots grew so deep, they were able to tap into the moisture there. So this notion of uprooting a sycamine tree, impossible. But then you add to that the fact that he's saying, well, all you need to do is say to this tree, be uprooted and essentially commit suicide in the sea, and it would obey you. That was a metaphor that really stuck out in their minds because the sycamine tree, because of its rootedness, was seen as, and according to the Lord here, interpreted as a symbol for for trials, for tribulations, for seemingly impossible odds. And Jesus is saying, listen, you can uproot this sycamine tree <laughs> with one word if you had mustard size seed faith. And this was something that struck them. On top of that, you have the fact that the fruit that this tree produced was bitter. It was bitter and difficult to digest. And that was a symbol of the bitterness and the unforgiveness that he preached about just a few verses ago, saying you've got to forgive your neighbor who offends you seven times a day, which essentially represents a limitless number of times. They were saying, Lord, increase our faith because we just can't do this. And he says, no, you can uproot this bitterness. You can uproot all this malice and unforgiveness if you place your trust in me, if you exercise just a little bit of your faith you're able to do the impossible. And that was something that I think really struck the disciples as they were having a hard time following Jesus and really reconciling his teaching with their limits, with their weaknesses. And I don't know about you, Joe, but I also, in my own life, looking at myself, I said, Lord, how can I do this? How can I become a saint? How can I forgive as you call me to forgive? And love as you call me to love. How can I overcome these trials and tribulations? How can I uproot the deep roots of unforgiveness and bitterness and jealousy and strife in my heart? And he says, listen, all you need is to apply your faith. If you exercise that faith, you cry out to me, then I will enable you to be able to do the impossible. And that, that for me, <laughs> is a word, a timely Amen. word, especially in this day and age when people are facing so many trials. Yeah. And tribulations. You know, when I'm going through the Gospels, I always like to pay attention who exactly he's speaking to primarily. You know, I think uh, mm -hmm. too often when we read, we just apply everything to ourselves personally, and we have to be mm -hmm. reminded we're not the primary audience. We're the fly on the wall who gets to overhear this thing. So, and in sure. this case, he's really been instructing and teaching uh, his apostles and preparing them for what they will have to eventually do without him walking next to them side by side the whole time, right? Uh, you know, exactly. uh, being the actual apostles and the foundation of a bishops that will come after them. And uh, so he takes them through the, the disappointment and the rejection of the Samaritans. And, and now he's trying to talk to them about their faith. I mean, I, what is the implication there, though? That they are probably going to not have great faith. Like he, the implication exactly. is you bishops, you <laughs> apostles are going to be weak in the faith category. Be warned. Yes. Be ver that should be a sobering passage for bishops. Oh, goodness. Listen, they've spent almost three years with him. He has on at least 
five occasions when you count throughout the Gospels, said to them, ye of little faith. And so he's on the death march right now. He's on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. And still he regards their faith as being weak. (laughs) That's to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. And they recognize as he continues to preach and to teach and to deliver these parables that they're just not up to the task. But Jesus nevertheless exhorts them. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, if you exercise that faith, that, that seed has the power to germinate. If you sow that seed and if you nurture it, it can do the impossible. So yeah, in context, yeah, this is pretty stark. I mean, his disciples, after more than two years of training, still have incredibly weak faith. And yes, it's humbling, especially when you consider priests and bishops and us ministers in the church. Yes, we must recognize no humility that we must cry out to Jesus, Lord, increase our Amen. Praise be to God. Check him out online. HectorMolina.com is his website. HectorMolina.com. Hector, God bless you, my brother. We're looking forward to seeing you back next week. Thank you, brother. Praise be to God. Dive deep into the Gospels. Get ready for Mass. But on the other side of this break, it is fear and trembling where you can win prizes. Call right now for your chance to win. 877-757-9424. We'll be right back. The Bible clearly says that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but the Catholic Church teaches that Mary was a perpetual virgin. How can that be? Mark 6, verse 3 says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Point number one to consider. There is no word for cousin or for nephew or for niece, aunt, uncle in ancient Hebrew or Aramaic. The words that the Jews used in all those instances were brother or sister. An example of this can be seen in Genesis 14, 14, where Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, is called his brother. Another point to consider, would the last thing that Jesus did on earth be to grievously offend his surviving brothers? Right before Jesus dies, John 19 tells us that Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to the apostle John. If Mary had any other sons, this would have been an incredible slap in the face to them that the apostle John was entrusted with the care of their mother. Also, we see from Matthew 27, 55, and 56 that the James and Josephs mentioned in Mark 6 as the brothers of Jesus are actually the sons of another Mary. And one other passage to consider, Acts 1 verses 14 to 15 speaks of a company of about 120 persons that consist of the apostles, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now let's see. There were 11 apostles at the time. Jesus' mother makes 12. The women, probably the same three women mentioned at the crucifixion in Matthew 27, but let's say it was maybe a dozen or two, just for argument's sake. That puts us up to 30 or 40 or so. So that leaves the number of Jesus' brothers at about 80 or 90 according to this scripture passage. Do you think Mary had 80 or 90 children? She would have been in perpetual labor. No, scripture does not contradict the teaching of the Catholic Church about the brothers of Jesus when scripture is interpreted in proper context. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling, (laughs) the Catholic trivia game show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot, 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling, a Catholic trivia game show with secrets and agendas that you just can't tell anybody ever. Stop tweeting it right now. Stop that. Don't tweet that. You see what I'm saying? It spreads super fast. But if you will promise to keep it between us, then I shall share them with you. Number one, we like to teach the faith and we look for teachable moments in the questions where you're going to learn something, at least one thing. Praise be to God. And that's always a good time. And then, of course, we like to have a laugh. We like to have a chuckle. And our callers are certifiably amazing. Uh, And if you call right now, you'll have a great chance to play our game, 877-757-9424. That phone number is 877-757-9424. Phone lines are wide open. Adrian Fonseca standing by to take your call at 877-757-9424. Call right now, 877-757-9424. 
757. 9424. First caller gets to play the game. And so uh, we, we learn stuff, we laugh, and we give out prizes, which means it's a winner for everybody involved, right? Uh, so this is the deal, though. The catch is I have three Catholic trivia questions. And we don't ask the callers the questions, so they don't need to know the correct answers. They could not know a single correct answer, but could still win the game. Because instead of asking them, I shall ask Rudy and Adrian. One of them will give us a correct answer. The other will give us an incorrect answer. The caller will then have 15 seconds on the clock to make a decision. Whomst do they trust more, Rudy or Adrian? And every correct answer then will go into the coffee cup of Divine Providence to win this week's prize. That phone number again, wide open phone lines today. Call now, 877-757-9424. That phone number is 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. Rudy, what could they win? It's over, Joe. It's over? It's over. Just like Coolio's life. Ouch. Um, well, our sponsor this week is CDT, and uh, it's over because we were out of Coffee Cup of Divine Providence replicas. We are? We just have one more. Only one. And the person this mm -hmm. week who gets drawn out of okay. the authentic coffee cup of Divine Providence oh, yeah. is going to win the very last cup, as oh. well as a copy of Dr. Christopher Malloy, mm -hmm. Mal Malloy. Malloy. Mm -hmm. Malloy's book, yeah. False Mercy. Wow. Now, when you get your coffee cup of Divine Providence, it's going to be autographed. I see. So you can choose whether to put it on your shelf okay. or actually use it to drink things. Or sell it on eBay as a or sell it on item eBay for like a billion dollars or something. But I personally suggest mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they drink three cups of coffee a day because it helps supposedly your cardiovascular health. Is that right? According to the study that I quoted today. <laughs> well, you know, I've been saying now for a long time. Coffee's gross. 80 Delicious. ounces of coffee a day keeps the doctors away. Huh. Coffee's disgusting. Pretty sure I said mm -hmm. that at some point. Mm. You should just go with it. I'm just going to drink um, mm -hmm. instead. Mm -hmm. Just like that uh, lady who lived to be 100 years old, really? she said, they asked her, what did you do that kept you alive? She said, I had a Dr. Pepper every <laughs> single day. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to do what she did. Don't do that. Yeah. Whatever you do, don't do that. All right. Praise be to God. Uh, thank you, Catholic Drive Time, for giving us some uh, cool stuff to give away to our Check listeners. Check out their website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. That's an amazing yeah. website, by the way. It is. <laughs> so glorious. <laughs> Praise be to God. All right. Let's go to the phones. Uh, Chris and kids in Flower Mound, Texas. Good morning to you. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. How are you guys? Oh, we're doing great. I've already had four cups of coffee this morning. Wow. Oh, wow. You, sir, are obviously very intelligent. Is your heart beating out of your chest? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the secret Wide to away. surviving Ready kids? To Praise be to God. Now, are you guys on your way to dropping kids off at school? That's correct. What, what are the age ranges there? Right now, I have my 10-year-old, my 8-year-old, and 6-year-old in the car. How wonderful, guys. Are you guys looking forward to school? Yes. Yes, <laughs> school is awesome. Praise be to God. Well, we're glad you're on the show today. Flower Mound, Texas, that's right outside the, uh, the small Texas town of Dallas, right? That's correct. We're just north of the DFW airport. Oh, really? I know the area very well. Praise be to God. All right. Uh, are you familiar with this game? Do you know how the rules work? Yes, we are, and we know. All right. Let's get started. We will start with... Uh, Brother Rudy Carlos, as is the custom, wearing his uh, classic, classic uh, blue tie with the paisel, paisleys, what are they paisleys, called? Yeah. Paisleys. This is the Pentecost fire the tie. Oh, I see. Okay. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So correlate that information <laughs> based on his responses. Uh, all right. Uh, good morning to you, Rudy. Are you ready? Good morning. I am. Are you sure? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you really sure? Mm-hmm. Are you, are you confident as, say, yeah. Miss Maloney would be? In Italy, are you that confident? Should I do some gestures with my hands? You should be very Italian. Yes, Joe, uh, I am ready. Okay. I'm ready to play. All right, praise be to God. Can you tell me which saint is referred to as the bearer of Christ? The bearer of Christ. Uh, well, mm -hmm. that is Saint Christopher. Is it? Yeah, are believe sure? it or not. Make yeah. sure. Patron saint, of, patron saint of travelers and... He's God. the bearer of Christ. And the bearer of Christ. Was he Italian? Just curious. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, let's just see uh, what uh, Adrian has to say here. Adrian, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Praise be to God. Could you tell me which saint is referred to as the bearer of Christ, please? Mm. Yes, that would be Saint Fraternus. 
Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fraternus. And he definitely sounds Italian. Nope. No? French. Fraternus is yeah. French? He's bishop and martyr of France. Are you being serious? Yep. Are you pulling my leg? Nope. All right. But it's the 450s, so French hadn't really been developed oh, the way we know it today. I see. I so see. they probably spoke Latin. They probably just spoke Latin. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Chris and kids in Flower Mound, Texas, you've got options. Which saint is referred to as the bearer of Christ? Is it Saint Fraternus? as Adrian is trying to get us to believe, or is it St. Christopher, as Rudy seemingly believes? 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Chris and kids, what say you? Joe, Divine Providence. My name is Christopher after Christophoros, <laughs> which in Greek means bearer of Christ. We're going to go. Oh, wow. wow. Christophoros. What, what is the chances? Yeah, praise be to God. No pulling your leg, I guess. No, no. <laughs> no fastballs for you, praise be to God. That was an easy one then. <laughs> now, any, which, which nationality is he? Does anybody remember? St. Christopher, I forget. Is he, he was, Greek? No. Oh, the name is Greek. He was uh, from one of the heathen countries. I forget okay. where it was, though. Like Germany or something? No, it was... Uh, I'll have to look it up. All right. I'll put, All right. I'll St. Christopher you. is the correct answer. Let's see if we can't double your chances He's with this Canaanite. next... He's Canaanite. Was he? Yes. Are you being remember, serious? Because they call him a dog-headed person. Ah. He was from the Canaanites. Uh, <laughs> Goyin dog. Canine. Canine. Goyin dog. Yeah, I remembered. All there right, here we go. Second question. We're going to go to Adrian this time. Uh, speaking of Goyin dogs, uh, Adrian, oh, man. <laughs> could you tell me a congregation of secular priests, a congregation of secular priests is called a congregation of what? Yes, that would be a congregation of the oratory. Oratory. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So secular okay. priests mm -hmm. gather together mm -hmm. to be able to live mm -hmm. in community mm -hmm. is an oratory. Oratory. Sounds like a, a toothpaste commercial, mm -hmm. but okay. Uh, Rudy, could you tell me a congregation of secular priests is called a congregation of what? Secular priests, you might think, huh, that's odd. What do you mean secular? Aren't mm -hmm. they religious? Aren't they? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they call themselves the secret society of secular priests. Do they keep really? it under wraps, you know, like, oh, uh -huh. we're not actually, we're secularists. Whoa. We're pretending to be priests. So you look to your left, you look to your right, and then you see secret priestly handshakes? Yeah. Oh. Actually, the illustration depicted uh -huh. one of them. Really? Yeah. They allow uh, women in there. Mind blown. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris and kids, you've got options here. A congregation <laughs> of secular priests is called, is it, as Rudy says, a secret society of secular priests? Or is it, as Adrian says, oratory? Quite a contrast there. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Chris and the kids, what say you? Adrian. You just gonna say it like that? It's so wise. <laughs> truly, truly, this is a very this young lady is very brilliant. She's very, very beautiful. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> very, very good. Yes, sometimes we have to admit it. Adrian is right. Typically, uh -huh. they used to have a, every cathedral would have an oratory of mm -hmm. secular priests. So secular priest means priest living in the world. Yes. There you go. Oratory is the correct answer. You did well. You're in for two. I think we can uh, get you uh, in the cup for three solid straight answers here. Let's go back to Rudy. Rudy, can you tell me? What is the completion of the eighth beatitude, sir? Is uh, The first half goes, blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice sake, blank, fill it, please fill it in. Uh, you might say that they're in Spain, but the S is silent. Uh, but the continuation there is, for they are meek and humble of heart. Really? Yes. Hmm. Meek and humble of heart, you say? Mm-hmm. Okay. Adrian, I know you have advanced degrees in Beatitudeology. Mm -hmm. If you could help mm -hmm. me here. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice sake. Could you fill the rest in, please? Yes. Uh, as someone who identifies as having a PhD in Beatitudeology, as you had mentioned, uh, the Beatitist. clearly the answer is for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, you said. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris and kids, this could be the trickiest. Is the eighth beatitude completed with for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, as Adrian suggests, or is it for the meek and humble of heart, as Rudy is trying to get us to believe? 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Chris and the kids in Flower Mound, Texas, what say you? Unfortunately, it's going to have to be Adrian again. Wow. What? <laughs> Masterful. Masterful. Unfortunately, Woo, 
that was fun. I, your I think, show I think his sister is obviously the smarter one of the family. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Cold. Yes, unfortunately, we do have to admit Adrian is correct at least twice today. And uh, it is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, completes the eighth beatitude. Well done. Perfect score. You guys, you, you guys are amazing. God bless you guys. Enjoy your day at school. Soak up as much knowledge as you can. God bless you. I'm going to put you on hold, but uh, God bless you guys. Have a great day. Hey, that's going to do it for the radio side of our show. Thanks for having a laugh with us. We always enjoyed that. Join us in the after show. Let's get to know Pesky Jesuit. He's hanging out with us in studio. We're going to talk to him next. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Praise be to God. Welcome to the after show. Or we get a lot more casual about the conversation and you get to drive that conversation with your commentary today. Uh, praise be to God. Guess who's in studio with us? Joining us uh, in studio all the way from the metropolis of Abilene, Texas. Uh, great West Texas. Uh, is it considered a village yet? I'm just curious. Like, <laughs> I used to have a friend from Abilene, Texas. Do you really? Yeah. I Her passed through Audrey. Abilene. I, I drove through Abilene on my way up to Arizona. It's a great town. Compared to Houston, it's a subdivision. It's, it's <laughs> probably not even that big, but okay. Yeah, it'd be, uh, yeah. I had a... Pesky uh, Jesuit. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we had, um, we had a thing. I forgot what it was. Uh, it was like an Arch Austin thing where we invited all the... Uh, diocese in texas mm -hmm. to send representatives it was region 10 conference that's what it was and there was like uh, the, the the diocese of of the united states are split up into different regions and the region 10 is like oklahoma texas and a little bit of a couple of other states and we all got together from uh from for that and i met someone from abilene texas there you go have you where are you from originally pasky i grew up in hollywood florida what? Really? Wow. So uh, where is Hollywood, Florida in conjunction to the hurricane right now? Well, it's directly east, all the way on the east coast. You've okay. got Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Miami. So it's just north of Miami. It's No, it's over on the west coast. Directly across from that on the west coast, you have Fort Myers, Naples, Bonita Springs. Okay. And it hit Fort Myers. And I've got family in Fort Myers, actually. Are, Are they okay? Are they all right? We don't know. We told them to keep their phones charged, and yeah. we'd get to talk to them when it's all over. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah, my dad's uh, in Orlando area. They're getting pummeled right now with a ton of rain. I talked to my sister, and she said she lives in um, Winter Haven. Yeah. And they were expecting 16 to 18 inches of rain in Lakeland. Holy That's a lot of water. It's hard it's to a lot of water. It's hard to, like, wrap your head around That's what mess that is. That's what ruined Houston was the waterfall. Yeah. I mean, like, it had like, I can't remember, most dangerous part nine trillion gallons. I can't remember how many gallons. It was a, oh, a massive amount of water fell from the sky uh, in Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we talked about that yesterday. So uh, we're going to be praying for everybody in Florida, especially since they have no power. That makes life a little, little more difficult. And then, of course, in emergencies, everybody's trying to text and do their thing, which means the cell phone towers are overwhelmed and nothing really works. Looks like it's going to move... By like 4 p.m., it'll probably clear Florida. Uh, Eric Rodriguez anymore. has already renamed you now. Uh, he says your new nickname is Hollywood Jesuit. Hollywood <laughs> Jesuit. Instead of Pesky Jesuit. That's like a is Hollywood a reference. <laughs> yeah, is that a military reference. Uh, so when did you move away from Florida? I Well, when I got out of the Army... I'm so uh, sorry. I'm a lot older than I look. My so. deepest sympathies for you. <laughs> when, yeah. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. When I got out of the Army, I moved to Atlanta. Uh huh. And I lived in Atlanta for about 18 years. Okay. And then I moved back to Florida for family reasons. And then I, I worked for FedEx mm -hmm. and I wound up in Twin Falls, Idaho. Oh, wow. Hmm. Uh, great elk hunting in Idaho. Oh, Idaho is God's country. I know. I can't wait to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my bucket list. Yeah, I've Idaho a lot of people is, claim that. It used to be America's best secret, but. 
Not anymore. It's not anymore. Californians are moving in there like uh, no tomorrow, uh, like they are here in Texas. Did you see the headline yeah. uh, from the Daily Mail? Um, Chicago robber um, holds up uh, Florida shop or something like that, and then the Florida guy uh, pulls out a gun and says, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the guy with the shotgun? I don't know. I just saw a headline As soon as Daily he Mail. saw the shopkeeper, he ran off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was a shotgun guy. Yeah, the shotgun That's guy. That's hilarious. Well, it's better that than being shot to death and dying. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. All right, so you, you get out of the Army because you didn't know that there was a Marine Corps, apparently. I don't know what other excuse you might offer, but nonetheless, you, you went through the Army. Uh, someone's got to, I suppose. But uh, you go to Atlanta, you move to Florida, you're in Idaho. How do you end up in Texas? I married a traveling nurse when I was in Idaho. <laughs> and oh, then she took you, you to Texas. Well, I, the thing I love about Idaho more than anything, yeah, except my wife. That's where, I became, <laughs> that's where I became Catholic. Good distinctions, yeah. Interesting. That's where I found the faith. Oh, wow. And um, I went to a great church. It was called St. Edward's the Confessor. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, I know there's a lot of between the old and the new. I don't think I ever met a more reverent mm-hmm. and, and God-loving priest in the new order. Sure. Than, than yeah. Father Julio. Oh, really? Pretty, oh, pretty he God. was incredible. And Father Joseph. And Father Joseph was just a kid. I mean, he was, yeah. he was fresh out of seminary. And um, we used to have this men's group mm-hmm. at six. 6.30 in the morning once a week, and we'd go over the readings Oh wow! for the coming Sunday. Yeah. And uh, Father Joseph would come to make sure we didn't get, you know, f- you know, if you start getting off, he'd reel you back in. That's good, because that's, that's the and, biggest um, problem with groups, men's groups especially. It was so neat, because we'd, we'd, we'd read the first reading, and then they, it would be just like if you were at Mass, the guy would say the word of the Lord, and we'd say, thanks be to God, you know, and then we'd do the second reading, and then we'd, we'd do the gospel. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just really blessed that, that, to be formed in that church. I have a lot to learn. Of I'm, course. I'm so yeah. new. Who doesn't? Yeah. But um, I, I look back now and I think there's there's a lot of things in RCIA that could, <laughs> could be. It's funny. I was <laughs> we set. were just talking about this yeah, yesterday. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, they, did, they did a yeah. good job. They, uh, they did. They really did where I was at. Yes, they meant well. And um, <laughs> but <laughs> they meant well. But it was just it, there's so much more. Oh yeah, and, it doesn't um, even scratch the surface. Doesn't even come close to getting you really ready to to embracing what is the uh, the deep ocean of yeah, the Catholic faith. That's not what RCA is for, though. Yeah, but uh, there there tends to be you should, you think there'd be follow up after, right? Like uh, there's well, very little follow up after. Well, they do have a follow-up in, in Twin Falls. That's good. They have It goes on for the following year or so. Yeah. It's oh, Mystagosia. Wow. Okay. But I wasn't there for that because mm-hmm. I had my first communion. Mm-hmm. I had like three weeks before I actually moved to Texas. Oh, wow. Oh. Mm-hmm. So you you were moving. So, but I, I became a Catholic on September 15th. What were you before? I was a Seventh-day Adventist. No kidding. Mm-hmm. That must have been incredibly hard given, uh, it's funny, I have a, I have neighbors who are Seventh-day Adventists and they're trying to evangelize us. So they're dropping off materials and I just laugh. I just kind of chuckle a little bit because like I, they don't know that I know the deal, you know, and, uh, and I just, I, I get a good laugh out of it. But uh, maybe for the sake of our audience, real quick, let me just say this. Hey, Josh Knoll, praise be to God. I'm so glad the baby's home from the NICU. How how is mom? Everything all right there? Uh, Let us know. We will continue to pray for you and and your family. Um, Pesky Jesuits, our guest, he's in studio hanging out with us, passing through town. So uh, give us the summary of Seventh-day Adventists. I think a lot of people don't understand just how anti-Catholic the Seventh-day Adventists are and how much of a journey that was for you. It's uh, very anti-Catholic. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, I mean, there's a mindset, and if you're raised in that, you don't think of it that way. Oh, sure. I understand. You know? Yeah. And um, uh, Saturday's their Sabbath. Right. Uh, no Christmas. That's Jehovah's Witness. No, I know a lot of stuff I mean, a lot of, that re- they don't, reject these. Uh, they won't do Christmas holidays. trees and they, yeah. they kind of shy away from it. They don't make as big of a deal out of it. OK. But most of the people we knew, they celebrated Christmas. Did they? They celebrate birthdays. Yeah. They do do birthdays. Yeah. Um, but the big thing about the Adventist faith is they, they're so separated Mm-hmm. Now, in a, in a sense, that's a good thing. You know, They're you don't want to like, be like the world, but they—they they, would you call them extreme Pentecostals? No, no, they're they're their own cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, 
but they are the their theology is rabidly anti-catholic yeah for sure and um you know i'm not going to talk bad about seventh day adventists i know because i know a lot of them yeah of course but their theology it's i mean it's just very anti-catholic and to the point where they will spend an entire you know they'll spend sermons talking about what the Roman Catholic Church believes. Yeah, you know, that hmm. when I became, when I was becoming Catholic, and I, and, uh, I had become Catholic, but when I was going through my my little ride uh, where I was uh, discovering the church, even though I was already Catholic by that point, um, and I was listening to a lot of Protestant radio, so, and I've shared this so many times, but like, uh, you get the Bible Answer Man, you get N.T. Wright, you get all these uh, famous uh, evangelists on radio and television, and Alistair Begg was a big one for me. But I just, I remember like uh, Greg Laurie out in California, they spend most of their time, most of their sermons just talking about the Catholic Church. They're not preaching the gospel. Mm -mm. They're not expounding upon what the gospel says. They're simply bashing the Catholic Church day in and day out. It's their thing. I never heard a sermon in any Protestant church on John chapter 6. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no. But, um, you know, all this constant, the Jesuits, the, that's how pesky Jesuit came out. <laughs> the Jesuits this, they're going to take over the world. The Jesuits, they killed really? this person. They so the Jesuits this. was they their culprit too? Them. Oh, the Jesuits are the great wow. society. So are you saying we have something in common with Seventh-day Adventists? Oh, please. <laughs> yeah. think, think of Ignatius. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I oh, mean, for sure. He's rolling yeah. over in the grave right now. But okay. <laughs> but but anyway, I I um I would hear all this stuff, and it just what the reason it stuck too is when my mom died and my dad remarried, he remarried a Catholic lady. Oh, really? Hmm. Wow. And she was none of these things, you know. <laughs> yeah. And she I was a Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> I was back in Atlanta visiting my my parents, and I had gone down. My dad at this time he was pretty sick, and he was actually in a in a facility because he couldn't. My mom just couldn't manage him. And I'd gone downstairs to do something. And as I passed the bookshelf, there was a book there called The Sunday Missal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I pulled that off the shelf and I started flipping through it. I thought, oh, I've got the evidence now. I'm going to I'm going to be able to. This know, is what they actually believe. Is, yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking through this thing Notice. and just. It was like dead flies on a wall. Every lie that I had heard, because that's basically what it was, you know, mm -hmm. they just started to fall off the wall. And I thought, first of all, I got to get one of these because it would make a great devotional. Amen. I could, you know, morning, noon and night. You just you got Old Testament, the epistle, the gospel. It's it was made perfect for right, a, a yeah. Protestant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, as I as I I was captivated with this missile and at the same time, I was scared because I was a Seventh Day Adventist. And I'm like. Oh my gosh, I might have the mark of the beast. <laughs> you know? This is making sense to me. And um, so I thought, I got to get one of these. So I, I went on eBay and I found a missile. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I got to get that. You know, I got this missile. It came in the, in the mail and I went to the mailbox before anybody, you know, I, did, I, was, <laughs> I was afraid to say anything to my wife because I used to speak in Seventh day Adventist churches. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, I was very active. And um, I, I can remember looking at that missile and I thought, this is the truth. Hmm. And it just got to a point where now I'm buying more missiles. And then I'm like, I can't keep these in the house. So I'd sell them. Hmm. And, and then I started buying prayer books. And I started, yeah. you know, and um, I'd go through everything. And then I'd, I'd have to get rid of it, you know, because I was like, I'm not there yet. But I swear I believe God kept me alive so I could become Catholic. Praise be to There's God. There's so many things in my life I shouldn't even be alive right now. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm here because... God wanted me in his church. Amen. Jesus started a church. He didn't start denominations. Right. He started one church. And it, you just can't pick up a Bible and say, oh, this is what it means. They're all wrong after centuries. Right. And start your own thing. Yeah. What, Did was, you, it like to, uh, what was it like to switch from worshiping on Saturday to Sunday? Uh, you know, I used to tell, I t and I still tell my wife, you can go to mass on Saturday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you can go to mass. You can go to mass any day of the week. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, w when I was a child, I went to a Baptist church because my real uh, mother was a Baptist. Okay. I became a Seventh Day Adventist because when I transferred out to Idaho, I didn't know where to go to church, and I couldn't find anything 
I couldn't just couldn't find a church I fit into. Mm-hmm. And working for FedEx, my hours were such that it was nice. On Saturday, I would go to church, and they always have a potluck. Oh wow! At church, and it was the only meal of the week I was getting to eat with anybody. Mm-hmm. Oh really? Because I had such crazy hours, and um, they they just welcomed me in, and they loved me. Mm. You know, and and that's how I fell into it. But you know what? The truth is the truth. And the truth is going to be here Amen. after I'm gone and after we're all gone. Yeah. And with just with so many Protestants I talk to, the, the idea is it's right now I'm saved and glory, hallelujah. But there's no reality to it. There's no when the rubber hits the road. Yeah. And, you yeah, know, that's true. And people talk about a relationship with Christ and, and you know, this relationship is going to save you. Well, that's for the Bible only people. That's nowhere in the scripture. Yeah. I have and a relationship I'm, with the Lord. I, I mean, do. it's very intimate when I eat him on Sundays. Exactly. Mm, you know, Tammy and, um, says, um, just as a correction to your whole Jesuit comment with the Seventh-day Adventists, she says, uh, the Dominicans are going to take over the world. Just ask Adrian. He's king of the world. Yeah. I thought that was the Franciscans. We'll have to, we'll have to, I'm going to have to reach out to the Seventh-day Adventists no, let them Franciscans know. Franciscans are taking over TikTok, apparently. But, uh, oh, no. Ouch. ouch. Well, I have, I got, you know, I, every time I drive by the Adventist church in Abilene, I just, it's like, Lord, they... They can't keep the doors open. Please make them mm. Catholic and close that place down. Hey, were you rejected by friends and family um, for coming up? For I have, Catholic? up until about three weeks ago, I had one friend from the Adventist church that would still speak to me. But we had a little discussion about Ellen White and her writings, and yeah. I haven't heard from them since. Ellen White is the founder. founder. She is the, the main yeah, there were there were there was a small group, but she's the main head. Yeah, she's that's their pope, by the way. That's yeah. intriguing. That's yeah. um, that they're she's, founded by a woman. She's that's the infallibility because everything, all their theology, has to pass through the lens of her writings. Interesting. Mm-hmm. If yeah. if if I pick up the Bible and I read something like in John chapter six, mm-hmm. where Jesus says over and over, "Truly, truly, my flesh is real meat. You know, my, it's real food." And verily, verily, and amen, and amen to these things. And he, you know, it's it's not just one place. It's over and over. Right. But if if Ellen White, her writings and her theology doesn't match, then they'll reject Jesus. The clearest things yeah. for Ellen White's right. And, and but yeah. they don't see that. We no, I mean, you know, they're blind. People to that. are a people are a product of their training and exactly. their upbringing. Their you know, tradition. Um, well, the, it's 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 true in little ways too in society. Doctors act like doctors because they're trained to. Mm-hmm. Uh, lawyers act like lawyers because they're trained to. So in other words, the way they even treat other people, they don't even know they're doing it. Uh, but doctors will treat other people in a certain way based on their training and behavior. I and lawyers do the same thing. I, everybody does this. We're all used to doing this because of our training. And we don't. We do it without thinking about it. So Protestants, they just they've never asked the questions. They've never even questioned their own theology. You know, and it's funny. And I this is where I get the chuckle part because. Uh, people don't know if they don't know me or my background, they don't know that I did a, a question all the theology. I, I, w- I was, I rejected the Catholic church after being Catholic and, uh, and went on this wild ride, which r- brings me to another question I wanted to ask you. Cause for me, the early church fathers were massive. Uh, did you explore the early church fathers at all? I explore them now. <laughs> um, not even, but not during your, your no, conversion. That's uh, when, impressive. Cause most people, that's what they say. Yeah. At the time, all this was happening. I had, I had left FedEx when we went to, uh, Oregon. Mm-hmm. My wife had taken a, an assignment in Oregon. We went there and we ended up staying there and I ended up getting a job in the hospital. Oh, wow. And at the, the when I was becoming, th- this is after, this is before we went back to Twin Falls. Cause we were in, we were in Twin Falls. Mm-hmm. I was an Adventist. We went to Oregon, and that's that's where I started getting interested. Mm-hmm. And then I became Catholic when I went back to Twin Falls. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, when we were in Oregon and I worked at the hospital, I kept getting Catholic patients, <laughs> and and they kept hiring new Catholics. Huh. You know, I mean, it was like people that did the job I did. There was yeah. like three three new hires, and they were all Catholic. Oh wow. And, uh, you know, here I am, you know, I'm a closet Catholic and with my missile. Yeah. And um, what really got me was, number one, I, I the real presence. Yeah. Yeah, that was I mean, me you too. cannot read John 6 and yeah. with, just be honest. What does it say? 
Right. You yeah. Know? But um, the catechism. Mm-hmm. I read the catechism the, cover to cover. The, the catechism, catechism. The catechism and council trend is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I gave I gave one of those to a guy from my men's group in Abilene mm-hmm. because we're doing we're getting ready to do a thing nice. on the Eucharist. Dope. Yeah. And um, I said, you got to read this. Mm-hmm. You, you got to read about the sacraments. And what's so neat about that is if you want to know your faith, get a catechism and read it because the Council of Trent, mm-hmm. it's written there. You, when you when you read something and it says, now pastors, teach your people this. Right. Mm-hmm. By golly, read it and learn it. You know, yeah. Yeah, I so mean, your pastor not going to teach it. Might as well read what he was supposed to teach you. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, so, it's so rich. Yeah. I mean, it is incredibly yeah. rich. But the catechism, and um, then you know, then you start. There's this thing called formed. Oh yeah, and that's where I watched the movie about Ignatius. Yeah, which mm. I liked. We enjoyed it. My that wife was... and I watched that for our anniversary a few years ago. Uh, rented a hotel and just watched uh, a couple of movies off of formed. Ignatius was one. Ignatius and Augustus, is a pesky Jesuit. And uh, and and the Augustine film was the other one. Oh, that was excellent. Yeah, but I really liked the Ignatius one. Uh, they did a pretty good job acting, and even there was some action in the film. And yeah, it was like a real know. movie. It yeah, was... it felt like it was a much better quality film than you normally get. Uh, when it comes to religious films. And I don't want to muddy the waters, but I saw that movie, Father Stew, and I was kind of disappointed in that. I never mm. watched it. Yeah, I didn't watch I was it. Really yeah. dis- I never watched um, it. I, the story mm-hmm. about him is probably a great story. Yeah. But they like should the have cleaned that up a little bit. I yeah. just My mom was so scandalous. I was, Kai, I was really like, because I'm sitting there watching that with my wife. Mm. And, and Bad I was just like, whoa. What you is know? your wife? She's a Seventh Day Adventist. Oh, she's Seventh Day Adventist. Yeah. So, uh, how, okay, well, how's the tension then? It's much less now. Praise be to God. I will say that the only thing we've ever fought about in our entire marriage was me becoming Catholic. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. I, I mean, mean, you know, we've never fought deal, about yeah. money. We've never uh, fought about yeah. anything. It's a big deal. It's a good thing to fight about, I yeah. guess. But you both um, care. it could ruin a marriage. Yeah. For sure. It, I'll, t- I'll tell you, I think, and I think her fear is that I'm losing him. Mm. <laughs> but now it's like on Sunday morning, there's mm. a certain point in the morning. If I'm not out of the house, she goes, are you going to be late? Hmm. So, you know, and I mean, my wife loves me. I love my wife. Praise be to God. And um, I think that she has seen that, you know, can I say this on the radio, come hell or high water? <laughs> Oh, she yeah, said it sure. already. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I know we're behind. Well, you can hit a beat button or something. Too late now. Um, yeah, yeah, it's but, fine. You know, I think she she knows that he really believes this, yeah. and there's a reason he really believes this. Yeah, amen. I was listening to whenever I was um, I got super into a reading on. I mean, when I was in high school, I wanted to watch everything that was on apologetics ever. So I was listening yeah. to the Coming Home Network. Yeah. And I listened to, I think I listened to nearly every single episode they had on YouTube. So I heard like a billion conversion stories. And so I don't remember who said this anymore, but someone um, was talking about the the strain on their marriage whenever they were uh, converting. And they were saying how the same exact, it made me think of it, the same exact thing you were saying. He was saying, uh, yeah, my, my wife was, was saying how, um, looking back, she was saying how we, uh, she, it felt like she was losing him. Uh, that his heart was divided, mm. uh, which is interesting because Christ says the same thing, right? Like you, oh, you're Scott Hahn. You're gonna be maybe it was Scott Hahn, <laughs> but yeah. he was like, you're gonna split your. Like Christ even talks about you. You're gonna have to serve both man, and you're gonna serve your family, and you have to serve Christ. So it's harder. But um, afterwards, they was talking about how the um, it was by the fact that he became a better husband, it was became uh, sort of loving his wife more, uh, more perfectly. And, um, and then she realized that it's not like a zero sum game that mm-hmm. by loving God more, he is able to love, love his wife more, more yeah. love his family more, love his kids more, uh, love his neighbor more, mm-hmm. uh, because of the love of, uh, the, of his faith. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm pretty convinced that if anyone is like, you're even that interested, what is it about these Catholics? Anybody that's honest, you cannot study the Catholic faith and not become Catholic. Yeah. I yeah, I, I remember the day that I gave my my yes to the Catholic Church. In fact, uh, again, I became Catholic to get married, so I didn't become Catholic to become Catholic. And uh, it wasn't after until after I had uh, a mystical experience that I went on this wild ride. And then I started studying, you know, and uh, someone handed me 
a tape set from Scott Hahn, a uh, friend, because we were going to this church on occasion, and they're like, yeah, I can tell something's not right with you, and you should listen to this. And it was uh, why every Bible Christian should be Catholic and vice versa by Scott Hahn, whom I had never heard of at the time. So I listened to that, and that was my first exposure to Catholic apologetics because I was listening to Protestant radio, and they had lots of Martin Luther said this, and <laughs> Calvin said that, and Wycliffe, and blah, 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 blah. But nobody ever tried to provide the other side of that story or the other side of what the response might be. Scott was the first, and so I was like, whoa, I didn't even know they had responses to all of this. This is amazing. Mm. And then I read uh, Rome Sweet Home by Scott and Kimberly Hahn. Excellent book. Yeah, a very good book. And then, of course, uh, I, it was Alistair Begg scaring me to death with his uh, Constantine destroyed the church. And I said, oh, man, uh, I really questioned uh, who has the authority to teach. Who ha- by what authority do these people purport to tell me what Scripture even says? Do I even fully understand what it is I'm reading here? I got scared, so I stopped reading the Bible. And then I prayed to the Holy Ghost, and uh, and I remember just feeling like this light bulb went off. Like, golly, Jesus, all I got to do is go back and study. All I got to do is figure out what did those early Christians think about the scriptures? What did they think about church and sacraments and all these things? They must have had an opinion. I mean, they had to have left something, you know. Uh, so I, I just started reading all these early documents, and my mind was very blown. And, and of course, I, I, I limited it. I didn't want to read past, like, 300 A.D., because that's when Constantine comes to the scene. I'm like, nope, I'm going to read everything before. So at, bef- at the end of sacred scripture— and before Constantine, whatever's there, we're talking about 150 years, whatever's there, that's what I'm going to read and figure out. And then, of course, everything was Catholic in that mm-hmm. and mind blowingly so. And then, of course, I just remember, OK, the last straw for me, John six. So I, I did a, a Greek uh, translation word study for myself, word for word, every single word in the John in John chapter six to figure out how literal the words were. Of course, Sark's. Trogon, very literal, literal and graphic, graphic, <laughs> dripping mm-hmm. hunk of meat, mm-hmm. chew, chew, gnaw, tear. You know, this is the this is what's being insinuated by the original Greek language in the Koine Greek. And then I I, I remember the day, like phew, I believe, Lord help my unbelief. I still struggle with Our Lady, still struggle with the Pope, the saints, communion of the saints. All that would have to come in time, you know. And uh, I and you know what books helped me with that was uh, Father Keeps His Promises from Scott Hahn. First Comes Love from with Scott Hahn was an excellent book for me to really wrap my head around the communion of saints and, and uh, the, you know, Christ giving more than just himself on the cross to us, um, giving us a family. So this whole me and Jesus nonsense, it's utter nonsense, it is. It, you know, until, until the Reformation. It's all about a feeling. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, you know, when you look, when you talk about the fathers, you know, I had read about a guy, I think, I don't know how you say his name, Hippolytus, 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 mm-hmm. and how they, I think he was burned at the stake or mm-hmm. something, you know, and what these, what these people endured, and I, I, I would read about what happened to these people, and, yeah. you know, I'm like, would I do that for Adventism? Would I do that for, for would you be allowed, would, would you I do that for going to, to church flayed? on Saturday? Yeah. You know? Oh, speaking of which, you get the Didache, which was the first document I ever read from the early church, Did the Didache. Protestant scholars believed that because they found so many copies of this thing, that the church was using it to, uh, they were having uh, converts copy them as a means of learning their faith at the same time being able to duplicate the document to spread throughout the ancient church because they found so many copies. But in the Didache, it's clear that the worship is on Sunday. Mm -hmm. The Sunday is the new Sabbath. And that is written in the mid 50s A.D., well, you know, the whole Sabbath thing at this, at this point, looking back, I, I was never a Sabbath keeper as a Seventh-day Adventist. Mm. I was an Adventist tradition keeper. Oh, I see. Mm. You see, you, you, can, you were a rat drag. If you're going to be, and, and I, I'm saying this lovingly, mm-hmm. if you are going to be a Sabbath keeper, you are not a Sabbath keeper by going to a Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm-hmm. You need to find a group of Orthodox Jews. Mm. You need to go with them and you need to keep the Sabbath. Right. With the traditions that, that yeah. make it keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. Or you're not a Sabbath keeper. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Which you, know? you shouldn't do, by the and way. Then, Don't do this. <laughs> and then, no, no. Oh, yeah. But then what about what about all the other Sabbaths? Yeah. You know, it's not just a weekly Sabbath. Yeah. So there, there's a lot more to yeah. 
it, when you start to when you start to think about what keeping the Sabbath means means, yeah. it, you can't pick and choose out of the Old yeah. Testament. It's just but like the you diet. Re- you really have to destroy St. Paul's writing, though, if you're going to embrace all these Jewish traditions and ideas and pretend like they're now they're they're still they're okay still, to do. Yeah. I mean, we good can't grief. even do them. I mean, no St. Yeah, Paul, no temple, no I mean, if there's one theme in all of St. Paul's writings, it's stop being a Judaizer. Mm-hmm. And you do know? you know how Peter would come after you? Yeah. If you decide to start slaughtering, you know, animals in your backyard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? They have plans. You know, they, they are hoping to reinstate the Some sacrificial are. system. The and, red heifer? Or, I mean, yeah, when I say heifer. they, I don't know how many they are, but yeah. they, we should get they back on the show. Yeah. Uh, they <laughs> uh, do want to reinstate the, the priesthood, and they hope to rebuild the temple and slaughter animals again. So I guess we'll see. That's but, why I uh, don't respect most uh, sects of Judaism is because a lot of them, because I was talking to this rabbi one time because uh, he was helping teach a class I was in, <laughs> and he was saying how most uh, rabbis today do not pray for the rebuilding of the temple anymore. Really? Yeah. And it's, oh, it's only very particular sects of Judaism that still do that. And I'm like, why should I even like have respect for the current iteration of Judaism today if you're not even wanting to keep the law? Yeah. Do you know how many Catholics I've even seen who are donning prayer shawls? Yeah, I've seen that. And, a few times. and trying to pretend as though this is so somehow a fascination okay. with this historical yeah. Yeah. antiquarianism, like Pius X com- com- condemned. You know, I, I, I love in sacred scripture and studying sacred scripture how you can go back and look at Jewish understanding of the Old Testament mm-hmm. and find its typological fulfillment in the new. Like, I love that part. Like, better understanding how those feast days actually work. So you read the Targums, you read all of these ancient Jewish documents outside of scripture, and they give you a fuller understanding. But how do you then take that to translate? Well, where's my prayer shawl? Where's my phylacteries? Yeah, yeah. Where's my? I like. You know uh, I, mean? I say I we like should Aristotle, bring back I'm not going to wear a toga. Phylacteries. What's that? I think we should bring back phylacteries. Oh, you think so, huh? I think they're cool. Yeah. Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I well, like Aristotle, go, but I'm not going to wear a toga. That's all I'm saying. Hey now, <laughs> hey now. A toga's for Catholic drive time tomorrow on Friday. What do you say, guys? <laughs> you go ahead, man. <laughs> I should bring. I should wear one. It'd be, be awesome. It'd be hilarious. Bring your sheet. Pesky Jesuit. Good to talk to you, my friend. Thanks for stopping in today. Oh man, this has been awesome. Yeah, you guys are just. You. This show is awesome. Yeah. I'm sorry. I meant Hollywood Jesuit. Uh, my bad. <laughs> my bad. Sorry, Eric. Hey, God bless you guys. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us today. I really enjoyed our conversations. Uh, do keep the Hauk family in your, continued in your prayers. They have an uphill battle with the FBI here. And the FBI was apparently uh, targeting some other pro in front of a clinic, I think, yesterday or something. At any rate, we'll bring you more news and stories tomorrow and great conversation. Do share us with a friend. We'd be very grateful to you. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you then. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend in Jesus. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. If God Jesus. don't do it, it won't get done. If God don't do it, it won't get done. If God don't do it, it won't get done. What up with that? What up with that? What up? Go Brandon, I agree.